funny you know, then say, yeah, and I work at um, at Cardiff University um, and I guess what I've been asked to talk about is a, is a project that we did uh, which we completed at the end of 2018 which um, tried to really kind of map this um, development of citizen scoring um, in uh, so in the public sector so the way in which data is collected and used and analyzed to produce some kind of assessment or profile or actually sometimes a numerical score um, that informs decision making in public services. Um, just to say briefly a little bit about who we are and how we approach these kinds of developments. So this is very much a collective effort. We're about 10, 11 people who work at the Data Justice Lab and our broad research focus is actually thinking about developments happening in, in terms of uh, data-driven systems across lots of different areas of social life. So this question around public sector and public services um, is sort of one area in which we, we've looked at, but we also have looked at issues relating to uh, migration, for example, or health or um, uh, in the workplace as well. And I actually think, you know, some of these developments we're seeing in one, one part, or, you know, often this kind of issues that come up actually translate across lots of different contexts, you know, so actually thinking about it um, in broader terms might also be, be helpful. Um, and we've been around for a couple of years now and our angle to some of these issues is often particularly to look at the societal implications of this and, and what we talk about in terms of data justice, which are the sort of social justice implications um, that, uh, you know, emerge quite prominently sometimes for us that's pushing the debate beyond questions of privacy which often has been the dominant way in which we need to think about this and also beyond questions of uh, protection of personal data and actually try to think about other ways in which we might have to consider issues of social justice to do with questions of, of inequality, to do with questions of discrimination, transparency, democratic process, etc. So lots of different issues that we want to bring out. So the notion of data justice for us is really trying to broaden the scope that we're talking about. So that's also what informs us. So we're social scientists coming to this topic. We're not technologists. Um, and that's also the approach we take to um, understanding what's going on. So we're looking at practices, we're looking at how data-driven systems are integrated into different social and institutional contexts. So the project that um, I'll talk about is this um, project that we did call Data Scores as Governance, Investigating Uses of Citizen Scoring in Public Services. And it focused um, on the UK. Now we wanted to use this term of citizen scoring, which seems to have become you know, more widespread now, but at the time wasn't used so much because we wanted to allude to this trend we've seen in financial services around a credit score and that logic of, of scoring people, um, how that's migrated into spheres of governance. And then we also wanted to use this term to allude to the kind of skewed debate around citizen scoring, which had mainly focused on China and the social credit score in China and this idea of scoring citizens, scoring in terms of trustworthiness, et cetera, which was often presented as something that would only happen in, in authoritarian contexts. And, and that kind of discourse was very prominent in how that, um, those developments were talked about as something that's very alien from a European perspective. And we wanted to sort of engage with this idea that actually, although, yes, the context is very different, this logic of scoring citizens based on data-driven systems is actually something we're seeing emerge across European uh, countries as well. Um, so this, that's how we sort of, why we wanted to, to emphasize this notion of citizen scoring. But it's broadly speaking to do with this idea of, of assessing, profiling, categorizing populations in different ways that sometimes results in a numerical score, but might also be another form of a category or an assessment. But we sort of group this all together. And so what we try to do from this, even though in the UK there's been uh, requests for lists that list sort of uh, algorithms that are used in local and central government, that kind of list doesn't exist yet, even though it's been um, requested or it's been asked for. Um, so we tried to go about finding ways in which we might be able to, to create a list of a sort or map some of these developments. And we did that by combining different methods. So what we did what we, uh, was that we um, sent out 
about 423 freedom of information requests to all councils and local authorities in the UK. I'm sort of very generally asking them about their uses of data analytics and algorithmic decision making. Um, and that was a, is a tricky thing to do because actually one of the things we found is that many local authorities don't know if they're using these systems or they don't have a shared understanding of what that might mean and what we're talking about when we're talking about what we might think of as citizen scoring. Um, so it's hard to sort of um, actually provide or create a comprehensive list. But from those uh, 423 freedom of information requests, we identified 53 councils that, uh, that mentioned some use of particularly predictive analytics, which I think is what we are especially interested in here, that it's not um, just simply sort of collating data, but actually that you are, you are trying to make a prediction about an individual or household or population needs in some way, which is kind of what you know, the element of big data alludes to. Um, and what we also found in, in collating all of these different um, or looking at these freedom of information requests was that um, there, is, there are few private companies that supply uh, risk assessment tools to a range of uh, different local authorities and councils. So we're seeing new public-private partnerships emerge around these developments. Although a few do develop uh, their systems in-house, for example, Bristol, which I'll, I'll talk about, uh, where the system that they're using has been developed by a data scientist who is situated at the council. But generally speaking, we see a lot of this being outsourced to a handful of private companies like Centura, like Capita, um, and others. Um, and we saw, found that predominantly the areas we're talking about is, are the ones that you mentioned already, which is sort of benefit fraud, child welfare, um, policing is, is a big one. Um, those were sort of the areas we predominantly uh, found mentioned um, looking using these freedom information requests. But in addition to that, we also then uh, looked into a few different case studies to try and get, try and get a sense of how these systems are actually used in practice. Um, and then we had a number of sort of news coverage that relates to some of the research and, and some of it, so that news coverage draws directly from the research of this uh, report that talks about the ways in which, you know, citizen scoring actually might happen. And I'll just give two examples just to illustrate of what we're, what we're talking about when we're talking about um, citizen scoring. So one is the one at Bristol City Council, which is used to try and predict uh, the likelihood of child exploitation. And essentially, so that system is built in-house and essentially what we're talking about is um, the integration of 35 different social issue data sets at the time of research that might have changed uh, subsequently. And out of that, so all young people in Bristol are allocated some kind of score uh, from zero to 100, which is based on how much they match previous victims of exploitation in terms of characteristics and behaviors. And that's essentially supposed to give some indication of, of the likelihood of um, child exploitation of some form. Um, so that's one example. So it's about integrating data into what is often described as a data warehouse or a data lake. And then on top of that, uh, try and create a predictive algorithm that allocates an individual profile of score to, um, to all young people in Bristol, children and young people in Bristol. Um, that's, that's one example. The other one is um, what we looked at in policing is Avon and Somerset Police, which is also encapsulates Bristol, where they have um, contracted with a company called ClickSense, where they have um, what was actually initially supposed to be a performance assessment tool. They have repurposed for um, existing offenders within Bristol and uh, anyone who's on that uh, police database, so previous offenders, but also could be victims of crime. And they're, they are also, they're ranking from high to low the likelihood that someone might reoffend. Um, so there you have actually just a, a sort of high to low uh, ranking based also on, on data and, and what they predict to be likely factors to, for someone to, to reoffend. Um, so those are the kinds of things, those are the types of developments that we're talking about when we're talking about citizen scoring based on, on data-driven systems. Um, okay, just to give a little bit of context as to where this uh, development 
comes from. So what we did was we interviewed um, a number of different, for these different case studies we looked at, we interviewed a number of different uh, people who worked in the councils or in the police, so public sector workers. And then we also interviewed what we might think of as sort of stakeholder groups from civil society. So these would be people who work with uh, service users, for example, or who work with impacted communities. So it might also be, uh, we interviewed also disability activists and welfare rights activists or community activists as well, um, as well as digital rights um, activists. So these, just to get a sense of what they felt were the issues with these kinds of developments or the challenges. And I think one thing that was just to highlight some of the context in which this is happening, and of course some of this will be unique to the UK and some of it might um, be something that's relevant across different country contexts. So one is this question around that we have a, a interpretive or regulatory vacuum, meaning what we found was amongst public sector workers, amongst different local authorities and councils, there isn't a shared understanding of one, what data analytics refers to um, and algorithmic decision making refers to. Also, there isn't a shared understanding of what it's appropriate to do with data. So we found a sort of heterogeneity of data practice, meaning that in some instances, councils and local authorities felt it was appropriate to integrate data more within a council, but not necessarily to create these predictive scores, for example. So you, there wasn't a shared understanding of what data is or should be able to do for um, um, so I think you know we, we can't always generalize entirely um, with this the, the really important thing as well that came up in our research is the prominence of uh, the austerity context so in many cases that was given as the rationale for why these technologies were being integrated into public services and Councils in the UK have had a significant cut in funding since uh, 2010 and as a result of that have had to at least um, in some ways argue for ways in which they are changing their practices as a, in a way that seems to be more efficient. And these technologies are often being sold as a way to target resources more efficiently or more effectively by focusing on those in most need, for example, by identifying who, you know, people that they should be focusing on. So the austerity context was, was incredibly prominent in uh, the rationale that was given for why um, these systems were being contracted or developed. And generally speaking, what, uh, what councils were saying that they wanted to achieve was one council described it as a sort of a golden view of their citizens which mean, mean basically they wanted more, uh, more information and more granular information about individuals and households as a way to, for them to, to do their work in a, in a way that targets needs better, basically. But this idea of, of more granular uh, information was, was key to what they saw was um, something that these systems could provide. Now, in terms of the challenges that they highlighted, they were predominantly what we might describe as cultural and technical. So, from managers' point of view, a key challenge was that um, councils and local authorities or public sector workers um, were sort of um, historically reluctant to engage with technologies to say, so there wasn't a culture in which they, were, they would sort of easily integrate these technologies into, into their practices. Um, and also, in some instances, they were saying, you know, social workers always will never sort of really go along with this because they always feel that the only people who should speak about needs should be families themselves, not anyone else, etc. So there were questions here about organizational culture and, and, and professional culture that some saw as a challenge for integrating these technologies within these contexts. And then the other key challenge, perhaps also partly linked to that, was often technical. So actually, error rates were often very high in many of these systems, um, but they were still used, so they know that they're high, but they still get used. And often that's to do with very poor data quality, which is to do with sort of the way in which data has been collected historically um, has, is not necessarily consistent um, and has a lot of flaws in it, et cetera, and isn't consistent necessarily with these uh, models. So that was remained, was a challenge that was highlighted. Um, and in terms of, of impact assessment, we asked about the extent to which they consult with citizens about the implementation of these systems and what kind of impact assessment they do. Now, of course, they have to do sort of some form of privacy impact assessment and data protection impact assessment, but there, were, there was a lack of any sort of general impact assessment 
all, including also how this might be changing professional practices. So are people making decisions about the allocation of resources and their approach to public services differently as a result of the implementation of these systems? Those kind, that kind of impact assessment wasn't there, nor was there an impact assessment uh, with actual, what we might think of sort of as impacted communities, how they might respond um, to the implementation of these technologies. And that's an issue because when we spoke with civil society groups and stakeholder groups, we found that there were a number of more substantial concerns that they had about the use of these kinds of technologies. So at one level, it's this surveillance question, so the sheer extent of data collection and sharing that's necessary for these systems um, to work and concerns about um, who would access this and, and you know, the, the extent of this, um, uh, the, you know, in, in, um, invasive aspects of these uh, technologies. And then um, the other one that's also, I think, quite familiar now as an argument that was highlighted in our interviews with civil society was this question about the extent to which these kinds of technologies uh, tend to um, entrench forms of bias and discrimination, in many cases because they're based on, on skewed data sets by, for example, collecting data on some groups uh, more than others, and so there are overrepresented groups or there might be underrepresented groups in the data. Um, and so in that, in that case, this, this was uh, brought up as, as a concern because, again, there would be, a, you know, it would be difficult to interrogate those types of uh, biases and forms of discrimination. But actually what came out more, which I think gets talked about less, was the sort of the way in which this will tend to target certain groups and will tend to stigmatize and stereotype. So in part because this is based on these profiles and scores are based on what people like you tend to do right so it's based on group traits in order to say something about an individual and there was concern that this would actually lead to a form of stereotyping but also that by attaching a, a risk score to an individual you actually engage in forms of stigmatization so you know one person said you know what right do we have to attach a risk score to someone to label someone as as a risk so this this came up quite a bit and i think maybe it doesn't get talked about that much then there was a concern about the extent to which it's possible to actually challenge these models once they've been implemented, both at the level of professionals, so people working or use, making use of these kinds of scores, um, but also among citizens and, and service users. And that in part will be linked also to austerity context and so forth, which will you know, in part shape the opportunities for, for example, social workers to push back on the implementation of these technologies if they feel they don't work or their ability to challenge what a model says etc based on other types of expertise and, and knowledge so the question of, of how empowered someone is within these institutional contexts was was brought up as a as a concern or a possible challenge but also in many cases you know well in all cases citizens don't know what score they're that they're being scored or what their score is so how can they challenge decisions made about them on that basis so they're was also um, a, a real concern. And then generally speaking, I think just to, I won't go for, on for much longer, um, there was a, a, a sort of recognition um, amongst many groups that they didn't necessarily think that the issue was technology, but that this technology is advancing certain policy agendas. So that these technologies are being used um, in part to so, as I said, the austerity context means that these technologies are being implemented in a context of service reduction. And in many ways, this was seen as what these technologies are doing as advancing that kind of policy, um, policy agenda of shrinking uh, public services and reducing public services. Um, so actually, this is about the politics or politicization via technology more than anything else. Um, and I think that's something that has come up, I think, in sort of uh, broader questions about whether we need to think about the implementation or the integration of these technologies in broader terms that speak to um, transformations in, in state citizen relations. And I think, you know, these are, are points that have been raised by, by other scholars who have looked into this as well, but just to sort of summarize some of the key ideas around this. So one is what happens to expertise? Uh, when we start relying on these technologies, and there is here a question as to the extent to which expertise gets transferred to these what we, like private calculus devices, so these systems that are being developed in private spheres, um, it's not clear what expertise informs these kinds of risk assessment tools and who gets to what gets to count as, as expertise in that context. 
and what happens to to you know domain specific expertise uh, in this regard so amongst professionals um, the other thing that gets highlighted a lot i think is is the fact what this does is position citizens as potential risk not to say that risk management hasn't been uh, a key feature of, of public services for a long time, but these systems tend to be optimized to capture risk predominantly. And so actually citizens are very much then positioned as somebody who is potentially at risk um, or a risky citizens um, is kind of ingrained into then what public services come to mean. Um, the other issue is about what kind of social knowledge gets captured by these systems and they are about so these uh, risk assessment tools will attribute risk factors or risk factors are attributed to individual behaviors and characteristics and there is a question here about what that means for social policy when that becomes the definition of risk and whether focus shifts away from broader so social or structural issues like, for example, inequality or increase in poverty or racism, et cetera, and actually gets uh, shifted to these um, individuals and individual households, that those, they are the source of the problem. So this individualization of social problems is another question that has been highlighted or another issue that's been highlighted in this context. Um, and then finally that we're moving um, away from looking therefore at underlying causes of social ills, so for example, underlying causes of crime, towards this continuously preemptive kind of mode of governance that actually targets, that targets individuals and targets families, but actually moves away from, from looking at um, underlying causes and therefore what we might think of as preventative measures towards these kind of more preemptive measures that are about engaging with, with on, on an ongoing basis. Um, what does politics come to mean in this, um, in this regard? Because uh, the sort of deliberative process that shapes policy making is kind of removed from this towards the sort of more operational logic that preemption invites. That's, um, I think I'm within my, just within my 20 minutes there. So I'll finish there. Thank you.